Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight we're leaving behind the Deep D, and going deep into the woods, for a fun-filled camping expedition. So I hope you brought your marshmallows and a flashlight, because it's time to get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. I live in a ranch in western Idaho, and every June we move cows from our property to a place on the other side of Hip Mountain, and because we don't have the trailers to drive our cattle, and because it's summer, we trailed them through the BLM lands and some private property with permission. Last summer, it was business as usual, bedrolls, teepees, and a few pack horses to haul that stuff. It's basically a long camping trip. A new place each night with the sound of cattle, and days spent with too many hours in the saddle. First two days always suck, but you get used to it. Anyway, the interesting bit. The third night I had to second watch, and basically made sure that the cattle weren't getting too far from where we were camped. I'm about two hours in, 3am or so, when the cows nearest me boogered pretty bad, and pushed the herd away from me. Obviously, that's a bit of a problem, so I went to check it out, as you do. When I tell you that whatever the hell that thing in the sagebrush was, wasn't natural. It was like a person except the arms were way too long, and the eyes were too big, and the skin was stretched in ways that were just wrong. The most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. I backed towards where we made camp, and thank god the thing didn't follow. But it was definitely watching me. I woke up my stepmom and dad, who came out with a rifle to investigate. The thing was gone when we got over, but there were some really bizarre tracks around the sagebrush, and when we rounded the cows up next morning, two calves were missing, and there were more of the same bizarre tracks around our camp, and where the horses were. Never found any traces of the calves, and I wouldn't take watch for the rest of the drive for obvious reasons. I still have nightmares about that thing. I do an awful lot of overland and very remote camping. I'm generally not afraid of wildlife, it's the humans you encounter that are far away from everything that scare me. I like to use topographical and surveyor maps to find areas that aren't maintained anymore, but hopefully had a rock based road that we can find in the bush. And after a morning of looking for one that I was sure we could find, I ended up coming onto an overgrown path that had seen a lot of foot traffic. Tighter to get my vehicle through, but after 50 yards of bush scraping, I was on a pretty good bush road. After that, we wound up this rock and shale road towards what we were hoping was a waterfall or a hot spring near an old logging base camp. I had clocked it as 11 kilometers from the main road when we came upon an old high lead logging crane, abandoned in the bush. I'm from a logging family, so I had to get out and check it out, thus starting the short but lasting encounter with whatever it was we found up there. I was climbing on this old piece of equipment, as my partner got her camera set up to shoot it, when I saw what looked like a wooden pulpit a little ways down the road. It was built so a person could be standing about 10 feet off the ground with a grass clearing in front of it. A few crosses were on it, right at the bottom of the ladder, to get on there, was a 4 by 6 inch high chain link cage, locked. That was the first thing that really caught my attention as this being abnormal. I walked around the corner a bit, and I'm standing in the front yard of a squatter shelter, completely rigged off for the grid. It had solar, and was obviously being hidden from overhead surveillance. I could hear my partner asking where I was, but I simply and calmly went quickly back to the vehicle, and told her what I found. As we went back towards the house to take some pictures, I heard the first of three shots fired from below us. Best judge for distance I had, was that it filled my ears at that distance, where the sound of a gun is in front of everything else in your hearing range. We pieced out of there, I heard the second shot when we were getting in the vehicle again and after we were leaving. Obviously my partner is convinced that we're gonna get raped. I'm just concentrating on getting down the hill. 
Eventually we kind of settled down and I concede that we're going to camp somewhere else more public that night. We decide to stop at a tourist location very remote but still popular. She wants to go literally hug this gigantic tree. And as I'm idly grilling and minding my own, a very busted ass first gen Cherokee stops at the road near me, then very very slowly drives by me, hard starting at me, and I try and act like I'm not startled by it. They stuck out like mad in something that beat up out there. I don't know for certain if they were the ones who shot at me, but absolutely in no way did I tell my partner about it. After we got back to civilization, I told our local Mounties about it and they were extremely interested in knowing every detail I could recount. A year later, I camped on a ridge opposite from where it would have been, with optics, and I found the logging equipment on the ridge, but no sign of the strange shack. Several years ago, my significant other and I had to bust a mission to a place in Apple Valley, desert kind of area in California, to these hot springs that I had camped out at. Our goal in mind was to recover this rental car that was rented in my name. My body had gotten stuck on a four wheel drive only steep dirt trail. I had met the owner of these lands of the hot springs before since he lives inside the log cabin that's built before you enter the parking area and start on the trail down to the springs. He was like a grumpy troll, mostly due to some disrespectful people who would come to his land and brought their guns to treat it like a shooting range and littered everywhere. Keeping his demeanor in mind from the first time I met him, I told my significant other to shut up and let me do the talking, because I knew if I could get the owner to soften up, he would help me the next day find the lost vehicles so that I could tow them in with his Wrangler. We ended up getting along talking and he invites us in the cabin and starts explaining how he came to own the grounds and how they used to be Native American lands and is extremely energetically charged. And I have camped here once before and have felt that way without being told about the grounds. I mentioned to him that I was native myself and he said he was too. We shared one of the same tribes and bonded over it. I then gifted him an item I kept in my car from a powwow I had attended before. He decides that he'll help me recover my car and that we'll do it first thing in the morning. And he says I'm welcome to park my car anywhere I want and can crash and meet later. Then in a slightly joking way, he says to me, good luck. My car was a sky on TC. So it's a two door hatch has a moon and sunroof and if you slide the front seat up all the way and lay down the back seat, you can scrunch it in for a night of sleep. So me and my significant other find a trail to park on maybe a mile or two away from the cabin. Next morning we wake up, pop open the trunk and get out to take a morning pee. We both go our separate ways and then when we get back to the car, we notice a set of tracks and started from where some of the bushes are and stopped overlooking my back windshield and back seat windows. The tracks were one hoof print and one footprint side by side. It only led up to my car and there was no trail of prints leading or heading away. It freaked me and my significant other out who had also grown up on a farm and outdoors and were very familiar with most things. We had stinging eyes of pure oh my god something's watching us. I see the owner the same morning to get my car and he gleefully says, glad to see you guys were good through the night. I never mentioned to the landowner what we had seen on the path. To this day, neither me or my significant other have any idea what it could have been. Does anyone have any idea or any experience on what this could have been? On a three day river kayaking slash camping trip, one of our campsites were occupied when we arrived on the second night. It was a weird family of five that said their party boat bottomed out and they'd been stuck there for days. These people had clothes drying on a line, pots full of fish guts sitting everywhere and tons of food and trash everywhere. My group trying to be polite engaged in conversation with the husband. I wasn't the one talking to him, but suddenly it got quiet as the husband finished the punchline of a joke with the end bomb. My whole group told him he needed to cut that crap out immediately. All of a sudden, the entire family grabbed some of their stuff, boarded the bottomed out boat, 
took off downriver with no problem. They left behind all their garbage, drying clothes, fish guts, and grandma's wheelchair, and were never seen again. To this day, my friends and I have no idea what the hell was going on that night. I want to start by saying that I've never been a superstitious person. I'm not religious and have never believed in ghosts nor spirits. I study physics and have always been a skeptic, which is what makes this story, for me at least, the more weirder. I was a freshman in college and I was going camping with some new people that I had just met. We were going to a mountain where I had been camping many times before. We get there at 1pm, set up camp, and it slowly gets dark and I get more and more drunk, but not too drunk. At this point, we're all gathered around the fire playing charades, but it's around 10 p.m. Our campsite is among the trees, and there's a large hill about 20 feet behind us. I have to pee, so I get up and start walking up the hill so that I can pee on the other side of it. The moon is nearly full, and I can see perfectly fine. I get to the top hill and begin to walk down the other side, which is a grassy clearing that meets up with the tree line. Now, right as I'm pulling my pants down, I look at the tree line and freeze because there was a figure standing there 20 feet away from me. At this point, I'm so drunk that things are spinning, but I realize what I'm seeing is not normal and I get a grip. I try and look at it and this is what I remember. It was standing on two legs, its entire body was white and it was definitely facing me and looking at me, but I couldn't see its face exactly. It had a large head it was so white that it was almost glowing in the moonlight. I honestly don't know how long I stood there and stared at it, but it was a while because I was in shock. Then it turned around and returned into the forest, walking on two legs. I ran back to the fire and told everyone what happened, but didn't want to sound crazy, so I tried to be calm and nonchalant. Everyone was so drunk that we all brushed it off and forgot about it 10 minutes later. I even forgot about it until a month later when these memories hit me. It's been on my mind ever since. It has really made me question my beliefs about the unexplained. What could it have been? Has anyone ever experienced anything like this? This happened in Southern Arizona. Two of my friends who are a married couple and I were walking on my family land. It's about 170 acres and heavily wooded with both pines and hardwoods and heavily trailed. It was dark, but my friends wanted me to take them out walking on the trail. A couple of neighbors dogs followed us, a coon hound and a great Pyrenees. And we walked south, then east to my camping area. We were hanging out at my camping spot when behind us, further back the trail we had come down, the dogs started acting strange. We were looking back and they came out of the woods to our left and stood on the trail. The Great Pyrenees started growling really low and looking defensive. The coon hounds a goofball, but he was also disturbed about something. They were both looking back down the trail to the west. I immediately got quite a strange and serious feeling. It was a bit ominous. I've learned to trust my gut, which I recommend to anyone in the woods or if around a person or animal that you feel instinctively is threatening. Anyway, I said to my friends, we better get back to the house. To get my point across, I sort of grimly added, now. Well, we were heading west on the trail and the dogs, if I remember correctly, had vacated the area. While walking, I looked back and saw my one friend, the wife, looking into the woods off the trail and stagger back a few steps. And her husband asked what was wrong. By the way, this is the area where the dogs had previously been growling at. She said, I'll tell you when I get back. I don't want to scare Derek. He's kind of spooked easy. So we get back and I asked what she saw. She tells us that she felt she needed to look off the trail into the trees. And she saw something halfway behind a tree looking at her. We had all worn headlamps and she said it was pale or whitish with an oval kind of shaped head. Looked like it was crouching with long limbs. She's kept stressing how skinny it was, particularly the limbs. She said it had a surprised look on its face like it didn't expect to see us there. Myself, my friends and relatives used the trails regularly, but not at night. She said the thing was bobbing back and forth in a kind of creepy way, 
like moving its head behind the tree, and then swaying its head and shoulders back rhythmically to look at her. She said it didn't appear to be aggressive at the moment, but looked scared. I pulled up the famous trail cam pick of the rake or whatever it is, and she got shocked and just nodded, yes. However, she made it clear that it wasn't exactly the same. The next night, I was on the back porch and heard a freaky, very, very shrill scream coming from the woods. I don't know if they're related, but I've lived in this county for most of my life and I've never heard anything like that. This is one of the multiple things that have happened around here, but this is the only one I know involving of a creature. For reference, this is North Alabama. Summer of 2013. I'm 21 and just finished my junior year in college. It's the second week of August, and a group of my friends and I go on an eight day camping trip. There are seven of us in total, four guys, three girls. We're camping in a semi remote campground in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. It was a large campground, but very few other campers were there. There were a few filled sites near the front of the campground, but we purposefully requested a site off in the back corner, and we were completely by ourselves. During the trip, we planned a white water rafting trip for one of the days. We were hiking Mount Washington towards the end of the trip and thought maybe we'd do one to two other small hikes with one to two days of just chilling by the lakes of the campground. We also planned on doing plenty of drinking during the evening. The first few days of the trip are fantastic. White water rafting was a blast. Everything is going great. So it's the evening of our third day. We have a roaring fire going and we're all just hanging out at the campsite, drinking and messing around. It was around 9.30 when a disheveled looking man walks past our site. His clothes are kind of torn slash worn out with messy tangled hair and he looks maybe in his mid forties. This isn't weird though. We all just think it's another camper doing a late evening stroll around the campground. About an hour and a half later, we see this same man walk past our site in the same direction. This time he's walking slower, almost with a bit of a limp. We're all pretty drunk at this point. I think one of us might have yelled something out at him, but he just ignored us and kept walking. Hardly strange, but still it's probably just someone who wanted to take a long walk. We wrap it up for the night at around 1.30 to 2. The fire is dying down and we head back to our tent. I usually love sleeping while camping. I find it extremely peaceful, but for some reason I was having trouble sleeping this night. I get up to take a leak in the woods, and when I do I see a faint light maybe 50 to 70 yards ahead of me in the woods. It looks like a dim flashlight or something similar, and I decided I wanted to investigate. I go back to the tent, and one of my other buddies is still awake, so I tell him about it. We get up to investigate, and when we do, the light is no longer on. Feeling a little unnerved, I shine my flashlight around the woods a bit, but don't see anything, so decide maybe my eyes were playing a trick on me before I headed back to bed. Sometime later that night, I wake up to a terrifying scream. It was Sarah, one of the girls we were camping with. I jump out of my tent as quickly as possible and nearly run into her as she was running back into our site. She's still screaming. She screams that there was a man standing in the middle of the woods. Now our whole party is awake and freaking the hell out. I try to calm Sarah down enough just to get her to explain what happened. She says she went to pee in the woods and saw the man from earlier just standing about 15 feet from her not moving like a statue. We're all freaked out, yelling, screaming, making a giant commotion. I internally freak out too, but try to calm everyone else down so that we can actually do something. We obviously decide to get the hell out of there and frantically take down our tents, basically just ripping the poles out and everything back into our cars and speed out of there. It's around 4am and we're in two separate cars and decide to just drive away from the campsite and clear our heads. Eventually at around 5.30, we find a small diner that's open and decide to head in for some breakfast. We all have different theories about what the hell just happened. Some of us think we simply ran into a homeless guy who was camping out in the woods and was either surprised by us, 
maybe some of the girls think he was purposefully stalking us. Either way, obviously none of us are comfortable staying at the campground again. I headed back to the front desk of the campground with two of the guys. We explained what happened, and the guys at the front desk actually seemed to believe us, but said there were definitely no other campers currently that fit the description of the guy. They were insanely nice about it though, and actually refunded me the remainder of our stay which astonished me. As a group we decided screw it. We weren't letting one freaky guy ruin our trip, so we found another campground a good ways away to stay in. Fast forward two days, we're hiking Mount Washington. We get up real early and get to the mountain around 7.30 to start hiking up. We're a little over halfway up the mountain when we see the very same guy hiking down. Though this time he looks much better. His hair isn't crazy, his hiking clothes are relatively clean and we're all just frozen. A few of us let out a surprise scream. He just strolls past us with a massive grin. Luckily, there are enough hikers nearby that nothing could really happen. We decided to continue hiking up anyway, since he's heading in the opposite direction and hoped we'd never encounter him again. We did finish the hike and fortunately didn't see him. After that, we did decide to cut the trip a few days short. Looking back on it now, we've all come to the conclusion we were likely being stalked in some way. If it was just some homeless guy in the woods near the campground, what the hell is he doing hiking down Mount Washington a few days later? It's a pretty unnerving and bizarre experience for sure. Camping in New Mexico in a state park, somewhere outside of Roswell. My now ex-husband and I took a road trip out to Arizona for our honeymoon. We had plans to stop in Roswell on the way back home and decided to camp at a site about half an hour outside of town. We pull up to the campsite about 1am, and as we're filling out the camp registration, another car pulls up. I watch a little closer, as I was in the car waiting and see my ex greet the two other men. They chatted, he gets back in the car, and tells me they were nice enough, and I noticed they had a dog in the car with them. We proceed to drive around the campsite in the dark, looking for a spot to pitch our tent. There were a lot of campers taking up spaces, and it was difficult to discern where we were allowed to set up, but eventually we settled on an area with only one other tent nearby. The other two guys drove off and had chosen a spot that looked to be more crowded, but we couldn't see them anymore from our sight. We groggily throw up our tent and crawl inside. As we're trying to sleep, we hear this strange repetitive noise sort of like a croak. We lay awake and eventually start whispering to each other about the noise. We freaked out, because we can hear whatever it is moving, but we can't quite figure out what it could be. Then we hear snarling. I quickly looked at my ex, and we quiet down to listen closer. It sounds like there is a serious animal fight of some sort going on elsewhere in the site. There's snarling, growling, and then a loud yelp. Then we hear voices. First, there's a wail, like a nightmare level. Then men begin yelling at each other, then we could hardly hear, but certainly nothing friendly is being said. Then commence more crying and wailing. Mike's and I look at each other, and in our heads we think someone is being attacked by an animal. My ex has a carry permit and therefore had his gun. I grabbed his arm and said, we should make sure those people are okay. We hop in the car, adrenaline pumping and start looking for where the noise is coming from and we eventually see lights from a camper and a car. The car belonged to the two guys from earlier. As we pulled up, one guy is sitting in the car with the dog, the other one is frantically tearing down their tent. A man walks across the path of our car headlights and is carrying a dead dog. I can hear a woman crying somewhere. My ex rolls up to the guy in the car who's obviously visibly shaking and asks if they're okay. The guy can't even get a real answer out. I noticed the guy carrying the dead dog turning his attention back to the two guys, and I elbow my ex hard. Time to go. We get back to our site and get out of the car just in time to see a car flying down the road out of the campsite. It was the two guys and their dog hightailing it. About three minutes later, a truck comes flying down the road going in the same direction. We realize it was the guy from the camper slash owner of the dead dog, 
and we decide that we want nothing to do with whatever is about to go down, so we stuff our tent into the car, and the sleeping bag still inside and tent pole still together, and drive to Walmart in Roswell. Roswell, New Mexico at night is a whole other thing in itself, but needless to say, we didn't really sleep that night. We pieced together that most likely we heard a dog fight that ended with the smaller dog dead, and the owner extremely angry. The weird croaking noise was probably a bird, but still, who even knows? When it happened, the only person I told was my boyfriend at the time, and this is my first time telling anyone. My experience at Skull Valley Primitive Campground in Utah absolutely terrified me, and has ruined camping for me, possibly for good. I would love to get some ideas, if anyone cares to comment. Here is what happened. The summer before last, I took a road trip from my home up in Colorado to the west coast into Canada. My northernmost destination being Fernie, British Columbia. And as I have family there, I mapped out a series of free campgrounds to stay instead of hotels. I loved camping, and it would help me stay on my budget too. My boyfriend at the time was also traveling, so we were planning to meet up in San Francisco and get to Seattle together. I was doing the first bit of the trip with just my dog, and my first planned campsite was a place called Skull Valley Primitive in Utah, owned by the Bureau of Land Management. I found the site easily. The camping spots are up a dirt hill, so I took the first site I saw, as my car is not made for off-roading. I set up my tent without any issue and changed into my hiking boots. It was so hot. I remember my poor dog had to have a cool towel down after I set up camp because he couldn't get cooled down. There were a ton of other campsites, but hardly anyone was using them. There were two RVs I came across parked super far away from the site, and I was definitely the only tent camper. I decided to go take a hike around before the sun was down. The campsite was adjacent to these mountains that rise out the flat ground and have what appeared to be cave dwellings carved into the face of them. I wanted to investigate, so Teddy, my dog and I, started off in that direction. And after a few minutes of walking, we hit a barbed wire fence. I didn't think twice about ducking under it and continued onwards. I just didn't think it would be a problem. Only a few yards after I'd hopped the fence, I stopped dead in my tracks. An eerie and unusual sound was coming from the direction of the cave dwellings. The best description I can give you is that it sounded like dozens of humans trying to howl like wolves, like many people pretending to be a wolf pack, and it sounded like its origin was inside the caves themselves. My dog was as spooked as I was, and had already started running back to the campsite when I turned around. The sounds continued, until I was well inside the camp perimeters. The sun was almost completely set when I decided to let Teddy out for one last bathroom break. I was freaked out by what had happened and didn't want to be running around in the dark. Teddy is a dog that simply doesn't need a leash. He never is more than several feet away from me and I don't use one. I zipped up the tent and walked him away from our sight and then suddenly he was gone. I couldn't see or hear any sign of him. The sun had finished setting by the time I finally gave up screaming for him and returned to my tent, which had not been left alone. The tent had a broken zipper when I arrived and my stuff was strewn about inside, though nothing was missing. I want to emphasize the fact that during this time period, I noticed there were no nature noises, no crickets, chirping or anything at all. I felt what can only be described as complete dread, sheer terror, and I was simply petrified. I've never felt so scared in my life. In fact, I feel the same terror just writing this out. It's truly the most scared I've ever been, and will never forget it. I decided to grab my taser and keep trying to find Teddy. After a bit longer of whistling and shouting for him, I realized he was not coming back, so I headed to my tent. I used some safety pins I had to close it since the zipper was now broken. And this is where things get weirder. As I lie there, 
Trying not to totally freak out, something started to violently shake my tent from multiple angles. I could feel it slash them brushing against my feet sometimes, and the shaking was relentless. At some point several hours later, I heard my dog outside the tent and peeked out. It was him. I quickly unpinned the door and he came in. His behavior was definitely off and he reacted to the constant shaking of our tent even more so than I did. Neither of us slept that night, and as soon as morning came we were gone. I called my now ex-boyfriend on the drive out, and recounted exactly what had happened. He started to google the area, and found out that the area I had walked into was actually the site of an extremely small and impoverished Native American reservation. So his hypothesis was that they had been watching me and decided to mess with me after dark. I can believe that to some extent, it's somewhat plausible I guess, but I doubt it. Anyway, that's my story. It was the first and last time I camped by myself during the trip, and sadly have not returned to solo camping since. While camping overnight, me and the rest of my scout troop most of us around 15 or 16, arrived at our campsite to find a single man tent occupying one of the prime spots for putting up a tent. It was out of the way enough and kind of late, so we decided we would let the dude who appeared to be sleeping stay there until the morning. A few hours later, my friends and I had a very uneasy feeling about the tent, and decided to try and wake the guy up. We could see the outline of his body as the tent was really small, so we started to lightly kick his feet. When this didn't work, we started to yell and make noise, but the man was motionless. Realizing the reality of the possible situation, we went and got my dad, who grabbed another leader that was a doctor. They opened up the tent, and the doctor confirmed that the mystery man was dead. The cops came three hours later, and we had to guard the tent from the younger scouts as we didn't want them to know, because they would have freaked out. It was super creepy sitting next to this dead body, with the full moon shining down on the empty desert. The police ruled it a suicide by overdose. There was a note that was left, but I am pretty sure due to the lack of cars nearby, and the dude being from out of state, and it being 20 miles into this park, that he and his friends took all the drugs the night before, then when they all got up and noticed that one of them had died, they covered it up with a suicide note and moved the tent out of view of the road. A few times in Australia, I had some really creepy experiences. This one time in the early morning, I was awoken to the sound of a really drunk guy with a thick accent yelling outside our tent for us to go back to England. I wonder how the hell he knew we were from England. Had he been watching us? Listening to us talk? He then started yelling for people to go back to Russia and Great Britain and so on. And we realized he wasn't yelling at us, he was just yelling. I think he was an Aboriginal based on his accent. So yeah, dude, totally get why you're pissed. On one of our first nights, we arrive in this empty site with thick undergrowth, well off the beaten track. The area had been absolutely ravaged by bushfires a few years prior, but had mostly recovered. A car pulls up late at night and people get out with their flashlights. My wife and I are on edge, barely breathing, and I'm doing my best to convince her it's probably just late arrivals to calm her down, but I too am a bit nervous. Eventually the flashlights went away, and they settled down for the night. I realized in the early morning that they had done exactly what we'd done except late at night, walked around the empty campsite to find a good spot before pitching up. We learned to relax a bit more after that. One night a bunch of lads, must have been mostly 15 to 16 year olds, with a couple of older brothers and a dad showed up. The site was about a third full, with mostly older people in campers, but we were in a tent. A dozen or so tent pitches were in a semicircle with a basic tinned roof communal kitchen area in the middle. And these lads took over there and were drinking late into the night. The sound was like an atmosphere, so it kept us awake. And at around 1am, I went over and said something like, 
Hey guys, it's getting pretty late now. Would you mind doing me a massive favor and keeping the noise down a bit? Cheers. And they were respectful like, yeah mate, no worries. And predictably made no effort whatsoever to keep quiet. About 20 minutes after I'd gotten back into bed, I distinctly heard one of the louder boys yell, I'm gonna go bottle that guy and rape his wife. At this point, it's important to say that I'm not a confrontational guy, nor do I ever get in fights. I was really scared, but also angry, and my wife was terrified. After about maybe another two hours of the noise, I grabbed my hatchet, got dressed, and walked over and put the hatchet down on the hood of the truck and walked over to their campsite, where they'd moved to, and started yelling. I think I said something like, it's three in the morning, you're loud as hell and you're taking the piss, shut up and go to sleep. And to the guy who said he'd bottle me, I'm right here, right now. I'm surprised the dad slash older brothers didn't say anything, but the kid just said sorry and that was it. Pretty awkward in the morning, I had to walk past them. But I just said good morning, and how are you going and all that stuff and it was fine. Admittedly, I felt like Billy Badass for a while, but my wife was angry at me, and said it was really stupid of me to go out and confront a large group of men like that. And she was right. And it was by far the scariest experience I've ever had while camping. One time when I was younger, in seventh grade, I went on a camping trip with a close family friend as part of his birthday. In total, there were five kids of us, all in the same grade and two adults. The birthday boy's dad and his uncles. It was going to be like a boy's weekend. Once we get to the campsite, we set up two tents, one large tent for all the kids to stay in and a medium sized tent for his dad and uncle. The first day was great. We did a bunch of activities like wood carving, canoeing, etc. And at night, his dad cooks up some burgers for everyone. And then we all went to bed, not really thinking about what the ranger said about leftovers in our way into the campground. Suddenly at around 2 AM, I wake up because I felt a large figure rub against my body from outside the tent. It sort of woke me up. At first, I didn't really think anything of it and was planning to go back to sleep. That is until I started hearing noises like something was looking through our stuff around the campfire. Now, before the adults went to sleep, they told us not to open the tent under any circumstances. But there was a little window near the top of the tent that you could look through if you opened the flap. So I decided to take a look, assuming that it was probably a few raccoons, since we did see some on the drive into the campground. But no. To my surprise, it was something much, much bigger than a raccoon there was a black bear eating the leftovers in the cooler. This was happening directly outside of my tent, six feet away max. So I was already pretty spooked because I didn't know what to do in this situation. I wanted to wake up the other boys to tell them what was going on, but I knew if we started making too much noise, it would be a really bad idea. So instead I just quietly stared at this bear as he ate all our leftovers for a good 20 minutes. This was already not a fun situation, but while this is happening, I decided to start scanning the forest behind the bear, which is when I noticed a few pairs of bright yellow eyes staring at the bear maybe 15 feet further out. So at this point, I was crapping myself and decided to just close the window to go back to sleep and pray that nothing happened. Like I said before, 20 minutes later, I finally stopped hearing the bear going through all our stuff. I take a peek outside the window and sure enough, it's gone. The next morning, we leave the tent to find a bunch of bear prints all over our campsite, with a large portion of our food having been eaten. There was also a bunch of smaller prints all over our campsite. We assume something else came by after the bear left. In the end, the dad decided to end the camping trip early, and we went back to the city later that same day. When I was about 12, my parents decided to take my brother and I on our first hiking slash camping trip in Jasper. We've done plenty of camping and a fair amount of hiking, but we'd never done one of those hikes to the site and hike around the area type of trips before. My parents are big outdoors people and they really enjoyed these trips and they know what they're doing. We hiked about seven kilometers. It was a nice day. And I remember there was a river near the path we'd occasionally end up walking by, but nothing too eventful. We got to the campsite probably around 3 to 5 p.m. It was one that had a main communal eating slash fire pit area and a bunch of campsites surrounding it. My brother and I stayed there while my parents went to the campsite to set up the tent. 
While we were sitting there, my brother came over and said really quietly, there's a bear over there. And I looked up and sure enough, there was a bear coming out of the bushes not too far away. My dad ran for a group of kids that thought about outdoor safety. So we knew to stay quiet and calm while we backed away and went over to our parents and said, there's a bear over there. My mom took me and my brother far away and my dad did what you're supposed to do. Let the bear know you're there, make a bunch of noise and scare it away. I think he even got the bear spray out, but nothing worked. Eventually, we decided to leave because the bear wasn't going to. My mum and brother had changed out of their hiking boots to Crocs, and I was the only one who still had their backpack. We had to bushwhack for a while because the bear was between us and the way to the trail, but thankfully the river helped us know where we were going. We eventually found the path and walked all the way back to the parking lot, where we called the ranger station and let them know what happened. The next day they came back with our stuff, most of it torn to shreds or with teeth marks. There was a small propane can the bear had bitten and my mum's shoes were chewed. My brother's teddy bear decapitated and the tent destroyed. We spent the rest of the trip in a hotel and visited stores and such in Jasper, which I secretly liked better than our original plan. There was this one time where me and my entire mum's side of the family were camping out of our state in Missouri. It was my cousin Keaton, cousin Gabby, Eli and a friend of mine and myself. Her name was Trinity and her boyfriend Kinden. There was a part of the lake that no one was supposed to go around because there were supposedly snakes and other dangerous animals. This happened at night. We were separated into groups of two. One of my other cousins was supposed to go with me, but decided not to because he felt a little nauseous and didn't feel good. I go with Eli without flashlight and set out east into the part of the forest we aren't supposed to explore while the others go separate ways. About 20 minutes or so of walking straight, we smell something horrible like rotten meat set out for weeks. I ask Eli if he knew anything about bad smells or whatever, and he didn't really know anything about it. We slowly approach the smell and see some sort of liquid trail leading to our campsite. Me and him walk towards the start of the trail and see a grown female and a baby rotting away covered in blood, each having stab wounds in the neck and stomach. Me and Eli literally scream like little girls and were 15 and 16 at the time and scream for help at the top of our lungs. I smell something else though when Eli didn't notice but I did. I smelt like my cousin's cologne near the bodies and boot prints that represent the bottom of my cousins. I didn't know what, so I yelled to Eli to follow the trail and go back to camp and yell and scream for help while I stayed back and searched the woman to see if she had any ID or personal information to show the police if they arrived. I found her wallet and credit card along with some notes for her work with her name on it. I gathered these things and sprinted my ass off back to camp to tell everyone. I was brutally terrified and scared out my mind. I thought I was going to die that night. Anyway, me and Eli get there trying to calm down while Keaton and Gabby are back, but the rest are still gone. I told my aunt, two uncles and grandpa and everyone else there. My uncles and dad went to check out the bodies while my aunt and everyone else called the police and ambulances. The cousin that was feeling sick smelt like manure and his boots looked wet. The police got there and handled everything and the ambulance took the bodies out on that. My cousin is a good liar, and I talked to him about feeling scared, trying to find ways to figure out if he did it or not. Still to this day, I can't figure out if he was the one who murdered that innocent mum and baby. I don't know if the police caught anyone or found further suspects, but they didn't talk to my cousin. I'm still scared to be around him to this day. And whenever I see him at family reunions, I try to avoid him. The detective that came with the cops estimated that the woman and baby started rotting anywhere between four hours ago. I actually thought by the way it smelled it had to be old because it couldn't possibly have been my cousin. It was just unbelievable to me. We had been camping for about two to three days at the time and I can't remember exactly, but the professional said to us that it was very fresh and to be aware and to look out for any suspicious activity. My cousin has always had a weird personality and was the odd one out in the family. I just figured out, not even a week ago, 
that one of my friend's mums had a lie detector test and is a psychologist, and I might invite my cousin to use the lie detector on him about the whole incident. What do you guys think? A few years ago, I went hiking in New Mexico with a small group of about eight. On the fourth day, one of our crew members had to drop out because they were having problems with the heat. So we had to backtrack to the nearest ranger station to get them situated. As a result, we were off schedule by about two to three hours. The next campsite was nearly seven miles away and required the use of a map and campus to navigate. There were no trails. We eventually got lost as the sun began to set and decided we needed to cut our losses and find a suitable spot to set up camp. Almost immediately, we started hearing a bear growling near us. It was already too late to move as the sun had mostly disappeared. We opted to have two guys walk around the clearing and bang pots together in order to scare off bears, while the rest of us set up the bear bags. Usually when setting up bear bags, you string a rope between two trees and hoist up bags containing your smellables food and chemicals and stuff. Unfortunately, our makeshift campsite was in an area of heavy deadfall. The ground was littered with dead slash rotting trees. So basically our bear bags were crap. Instead of 15 feet off the ground, they were maybe five. We basically skipped dinner because we weren't sure if we had enough water to cook, considering we were still lost and needed it for the next day. Predictably, the bears did not leave us alone. At this point, it was pretty clear that there were at least two of them. They continued to circle our camp and growl, keeping far enough away to where we couldn't see them. Needless to say, it was a stressful night, but we all managed to get some sleep. I woke up several times to hear a bear very close, but I couldn't see them from inside the tent. The next morning, we found our bear bags untouched. We packed up camp and finally managed to figure out where we were. Then, we arrived at the next camp on our trip and indulged in our one pack of dehydrated biscuits and gravy. Dead of night, I woke up to the sound of shoveling. There's no mistaking the sound of a shovel cutting through gravel. This was during a short road trip on the Olympic Peninsula. My partner and I found a free designated camping area near an OHV public use area. It was already getting dark as we turn off the highway, go down a short dirt road, turn right, and it opened into a roughly circulated clearing, 200 feet across. Five small campsites, each with a firing and picnic table side by side up against the back of the clearing, with small strips of recently planted vegetation separating the sites. The leftmost site was occupied by one of those 10 by 10 easy ups with the walls all zipped up and no car around. We took second from the end, planning a big hike in the morning. We set up our tent, didn't bother with stakes, just hopped in and called it an early night. 2am rolls around and I wake up to what sounds unmistakably like the sound of shoveling. I listen for a little while and it's coming from the first sight. I can see the glow of a lantern through the tent wall and hear the beat of some EDM. I wake up my partner who usually sleeps with earplugs in and she immediately can see something is wrong by the look on my face. She sits up and we start whispering. I don't know. I just woke up. We should go. At that point, the shoveling stops. We hear footsteps on gravel and then the EDM gets cranked right up to 11. What the hell? We both squirmed out of our sleeping bags at this point, not wanting to make the zipper sound and are sitting upright, making a plan. You take the car keys, hop in, start the engine, pop the trunk. Don't forget to unlock the passenger door. I'll collapse the tent and stuff everything in. And then we get the hell out of here. Then I heard it. Heavy breathing, moans, grunts, all of it coming from the first sight. What the hell was going on? She unzips the tent. We jump out, she hops in and starts the car and I can hear the trunk pop. Two poles at the foot of the tent, two poles at the head. I pop them all in and start wadding up balls of fabric, shortening tent poles in the process and look over to site number one. Instead of a lantern and construction utility light was set up on the ground pointing upwards. 
the easy up walls were unzipped, a pickup had backed into the site, and I could see the handle of a shovel coming out of a small hole in the ground. And in front of this, a man and woman, naked, straddling the picnic table. They actually seemed surprised to see us both and turned away, which at that time immediately made me feel better. At least they had the presence of mind to be embarrassed. I didn't stop to say anything, crammed the tent mass into the trunk, jumped in the car and just drove away. What did we just encounter? My boys and I, we're dry camping on a plateau above one of the many canyons in the Snake River wilderness in late summer. The first night at around 1am we saw several lights rise into the sky, what seemed to be about 10 miles away. We immediately thought it was just drones and thought nothing of it. Then we started seeing flashing amber lights reflecting off the canyon walls. So naturally my curiosity compelled me to see what was going on. We got in the truck and started driving down the only road in the area, hoping that we could get close enough to see. After about 30 minutes, everything went dark and we never saw any more lights. We never did find out what it was. On the second night, we had just gotten to sleep when I was awoken by wolves howling. At that point, I wasn't scared at all, just kind of fascinated by the sound. They seemed pretty far off and it was cool to listen to. I drifted back to sleep and then some time later was awoken by the sound of running animals. I bolted upright just in time to see several animals that looked to be wolves, which was hard to tell by the moonlight through the tent screen, running past our truck. They never stopped, just ran ahead of us. It is the only time I've ever seen wolves in the wild, and it was intimidating to see just how big they really are. But even with all the excitement, that wasn't the scariest part of the night. About two hours after the wolf event, I had to get up to pee. I didn't even want to get out the tent, but the bladder kind of forced the issue. I worked up the courage to get up, slung my gun around my shoulder and stepped out. I was about midstream when a thud and the sound of footfalls came from the area just to my right. I spun and drew my gun in full picnic only to realize it was a cow rubbing against a small pine tree about 40 yards away and have never been so relieved to see a cow in my life. I was camping at the lake at the Horns of Alberta. It's about a 12 kilometer hike and 700 meter elevation to get to the lake. Most of the elevation is in the last 500 meters when you hit the headwall. We knew ahead of time that you weren't supposed to camp at the lakes as there isn't any flat ground or tree cover. Instead, you camp below the headwall. However, for multiple reasons, we decided to camp at the lake where we found some flat, small squares of land that we could pitch a tent, although it was like five meters away from the water, with no tree or even a bush to cover at all. We did this for a few reasons because we wanted to avoid mosquitoes which had eaten us alive the night before since we had lost our bug spray. One of our friends was new to hiking and didn't have the energy to hike back down and it was also just an amazing view. Fast forward a few hours and the strongest winds I've ever felt in my life began pounding us. Our tent, which was pegged in and had our bags inside, got lifted off the ground and almost flew into the lake. We managed to grab it just in time and I was holding onto the tent as everyone else was grabbing everything we had and we're just gonna sit in the tent until the winds died down. During this time, we were getting absolutely soaked a bit because of some rain, but mostly because of the wind lifting up spray from the lake. Then this one gust came and hit me so hard, I felt like I might get lifted off the ground and pushed me forward to fall onto the tent, which ripped the fly. Once the initial rip had happened, the wind tore it open and off the tent. At this point, we decided to take the tent down and pack everything in our bags, otherwise everything else would get soaked without the fly. I should mention that during all of this, I was tripping on shrooms. Thankfully, it wasn't turning into a bad trip. I was actually laughing so hard and felt the deepest sense of adventure I have ever felt in my life. Though I was quite scared, we would have to spend the night sitting on the ground getting cold and wet and no sleep, followed by an absolutely miserable hike out the next day. At this point, we could have tried to hike down to the headwell to the main campsite, 
but it was getting dark, windy and wet, two of us were tripping, and I'm glad we decided not to do this, as one of us could have easily fallen off the cliff and died in these conditions. It's sketchy enough hiking down in perfect conditions. Instead, we sat beside some bushes on the opposite side of the lake, and prayed the wind would die down soon. After an hour, things had eerily calmed down, and we decided to set up the tent again, hoping that the fly would still be usable. We did everything we could to secure the fly to the tent, and it seemed like it might hold, but if another gust of wind came, it would surely rip it off, and if it rained, it would suck. Thankfully, despite some more wind in the night, during which I was lying awake, praying that the fly held, it did indeed hold, and we made it through the night dry, with a few hours of sleep. Every summer, my family went camping on remote campsites that were very typically islands in the middle of a lake, or a piece of edge not accessible except from water. The body of water is quite big. There are a lot of fish, but you mostly see trout and catfish in the area, nothing too big. But well, my best friend came with us this year, and all the adults were drinking by the fire at dusk. It was getting darker, but the twilight illuminated the water enough to do some fishing still. So I cast off a rock with my friend by my side. I felt a bite and started to reel it in. And it was big, the biggest fish I'd ever had on my line to date. I don't fish much, mostly for food, and was just barely able to pull the thing above water. And we were hollering at this point for my parents' help, but they were busy drinking. The fish had to have been at least two feet long. My fishing pole was almost bent in half, and unfortunately, as I was reeling it in, my line snapped from the weight of the fish my 60 pound rated fishing wire, flung it into the tree above me and I lost my lure. We freaked out and were yelling to my family about this huge fish. My dad said that there aren't many fish that big in the lake and there's no way and that we were exaggerating how big it was. But even 10 years later, I brought it up and we both remember the exact same thing, a massive monster of a fish that did not belong in the water. I still wonder, what it was, and how that monster got there. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. Decided to make this one extra long. I know you guys appreciate when it is a bit longer than usual. However, my voice is now paying the price. I'd like to thank everyone who commented on my latest poll. You guys really made me laugh. I misspelled C, I put deep D instead of deep C, and yeah, it sounds silly, but it really made me laugh. I think it was a funny mistake to make in the poll. So thank you to everyone who commented. It made my, well, made my day, it made me smile. Thank you. I'll try and watch my spelling in future, I suppose. If you enjoyed the video, it would be really cool if you could like, maybe sub, maybe press the bell icon if you haven't already, for new stories every single night. Um, yeah, huge thanks also to my members and patrons, names on screen, who support the channel with a monthly donation. Of course, it means the world to me. And if you want to contribute too, that would be awesome. Your name goes at the end of the video, like these amazing people here. And I'm so, so grateful for each and every one of you. Anyway, I'm going to end it here. My voice is literally dying. <laughs> so for now, take care, stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.